Gentlemen, what is the verdict? Are you innocent? Order! 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 Tell me what I've heard isn't true. These actions are seditious and amount to treason. In the 19th century, three epic trials changed the course of Australian history. Even if the girl were of bad character, that did not entitle her to be outraged as if she were a beast. In each case, men were on trial for their lives. I knew the men were guilty of murder, but I would never see a white man hanged for killing a black. In each courtroom, the jury held the future of Australia in its hands. This series is based on actual court reports, which show how the very basis of colonial society was being challenged. It is landowners who generate the wealth in this colony, and I shall do as I damn well see fit! The court's decisions still resonate today. God help you to repent for these crimes. The Mount Rennie outrage was a vicious gang rape which took place in the scrublands of Sydney in the 1880s. The victim was a girl named Mary Jane Hicks. If the jury believed her evidence, 11 young men were facing execution. It was a case which bitterly divided opinion, a case in which Australian masculinity was on trial. I can't help you. Bring her in, you fucking stuck old bitch! The Pope would be ashamed of you. Bring her in! She was here. She isn't now. I'm sorry for you all. This girl from the country found herself at the centre of a huge public outcry. This was the scene of the appalling crime. A dozen roughneck boys gang raped 16 year old Mary Jane Hicks here at Mount Rennie. This prospering city had been founded a hundred years earlier as a place of banishment for convicts. And now this crime seemed to prove to many people something they'd always feared, that the blood of the convicts was still flowing in the veins of Australian men. Mary Jane's suffering seemed to be a curse from the past. My name is Mary Jane X. I am a servant girl. I'm 16 years of age. I was educated at the Bathurst Convent School, St Mary's. I do not know how many years I was there. I know nothing whatever about my father and mother. My uncle suggested I come to Sydney, but he did not meet me at the railway terminus Redfern. I now lodge at Mrs Anderson's. On Thursday morning last, I left her house to find an employment registry in Castlereagh Street. While I was in Sussex Street, I saw the cabman, Sweetman. I twice refused his offers, but the third time he asked, I got into the vehicle. I didn't know where he was taking me to. He kept going through the town. At Moor Park, he stopped. He left his seat, came into the cab and commenced to take liberties with me. I screamed loudly and this brought a young man. He said that the cabman was driving me to disgrace and offered to show me the way to the tram line. In the past three years, Sydney had been rocked by three pack rapes. Two of the victims had died within hours. In this latest case, a gang, the Waterloo Push, had been out to teach the girl a lesson. This girl who was upmarket enough to be riding around in a carriage, no less. But the Waterloo push was about to be challenged. Mary Jane Hicks survived, and she was willing to press charges. He was one of them. Not me. Keep your silence. Him. He was one who did it to me. 
I, I saw the faces of four or five who assaulted me. No, not him. He did it after the other one. I think so. Out. One member of the Waterloo push turned Queen's evidence. Jockey Nobody Smith named names. When I recovered consciousness, I felt very ill. I had very little clothing on. When I left the house that morning, I was tidily dressed. I never had any sweetheart. I have never cohabited with men of questionable character. Up until Thursday last, I had maintained purity of person. In New South Wales, rape was a hanging offence. That hadn't been the case in England for decades. Here, the guardians of civilization believed that the ultimate punishment was the only deterrent against those barbarians and savages out on the frontier. But the accused in this case were 11 city boys. Their average age was 19. George Robert Reed, 19, Labourer, Victoria. William Boyce, age 19, Will Washer, Redford. Hugh Miller, Labour, Waterloo. George Duffy, Daptal, Will Washer. Thomas Oscroft, I plead not guilty. I reserve my defence. William Newman, 18 years, dealer. Joseph Martin, 17, wool washer. George Keegan, 19. Michael Mangan, labourer. Michael Dolan, 17. William Hill, cleaner, Redford, 22 years old, and not guilty of the charge. The Mount Rennie rape trial galvanised Sydney, with many people questioning the conduct of these lawless young men the so-called larrikins. Larrikinism has descended into wickedness. The corners of streets, the parks, are really out-of-door clubs where obscenity... If a former brute who committed these acts in, in Waterloo and in Woolloomooloo had been hanged, would we now be lamenting this... Six lady? years ago, the New South Wales government took over the education of our children. State schools neglect the Christian religion. Well, perhaps we should ask ourselves, whether a gang rape has replaced bush ranging as the authentic Australian crime. Make an example of them. The lot should hang. Get your hands off me. Would you like to know the facts? I know what I've read. The coppers rounded up every youth not working that day. That's why they're on trial. Every Irish Catholic youth. Eight of those boys are God-fearing Catholic. Speak for yourself about Catholic. At least one of them's innocent. That's my son. Because of the large number on trial, an extra bench is needed in the dock. All be seated! Only one of these youths had been granted bail. This jury was sitting in judgement not just on these 11 boys, but on the whole code of the larrikins. Did they represent Australia? or disgrace it. Prisoner Mangan. All rise. accused accept the jury presented before them? You may answer yes or no. Yes. 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 
This is a case that has never before occupied the attention of a court of justice. It is possible that you have read or heard something of the terrible revelations. If so, you should pay no attention to them, but simply listen to the witnesses. You should not allow any consideration to interfere with your solemn duty. The prisoners are charged with the crime of rape, committed on September 9th last, in the very light of day, in one of the public parks. A diabolical outrage on a defenseless woman. All the prisoners, except three, violated her in a most brutal manner, some when she was in a semi-comatose state. If you decide that the men were all present, then they are equally guilty with those who did violate her. The girl has sworn positively that with the exception of Hill, Oscroft and Keegan, she was violated by these youths. When the police came on the scene, Ms. Hicks was found partially clad, dazed and helpless. Most of the newspapers were on the side of Mary Jane Hicks. But J.F. Archibald, the editor of the popular magazine The Bulletin, actively campaigned against the case and Justice Windia. I note your reporters diligently digesting every word that drips from Windia's lips. Uh, the Globe think him a fine judge, the right man for this trial. We think him cruel, self-righteous, and more obsessed with getting a knighthood than dispensing justice. Windy is yet to pay for bringing down Chief Justice Solomons. And if you recall, we thought Solomons rather fine. Windy is the system personified. He's on trial here as well, side by side with a degraded tart. Windia was everything that Archibald detested. He had refined English manners, a private school education, and he certainly didn't share Archibald's romantic view of larrikins. And he was a champion of the rights of women. All of which, according to Archibald, disqualified the judge from giving a fair trial to 12 working-class Australian men, accused by some little trollop of rape. Speak up for the court, please, Miss Hicks. Yes. That is the clothing that I was wearing that day. My blue print dress, my body skirt and pieces. That bow was on my hair. That glove is one of those I had and my parasol. They are my things. Thank you. The young man who took me down from the cab and I thought was helping me. He's not among the prisoners. Will you tell the court what happened when he walked you into the bush? He said that he thought I must be feeling tired and asked me to sit down for a little while. He said that if I rested he would gather me some flowers. The young man then went and spoke to four or five other young men who were standing not far away. He returned and gave me the flowers. Shortly afterwards, he endeavoured to commit a criminal offence upon me. What happened then, Miss Hicks? I screamed. And then two men came from a totally different direction. The man I know now was Mr Stanley. And the person who had tried to assault me ran away. Mr Stanley took me by the arm to help me, and I got away, about, about from here to the dock, when Hill came up and took me away from Stanley. Did you know Hill before this moment? No. I know now that his name is Hill. Please tell the court what happened when he took your arm. I cried. You get off her. I get off her. And then before he took me into the bush, I saw the other men pelting stones and old boots at Stanley. I'm not going. And then someone among the others threw a lemonade bottle at me, which struck me on the back. After Hill moved away, there were four men with me. I recognised the second, the third, fourth men in the first row in the dock and the last man in the second row. 
They offered to show me the way to the tram line so that I could return home. I accompanied them because I thought that if I refused, they would compel me. They took me farther into the bush. Please tell the court what happened then. One of them broke up some scrub and threw me down. That was Duffy. Some of them had their hands over my mouth to prevent me screaming. Others had their hands over my eyes. Two more men were holding my legs. And then four more men came at me out of the bush. And I got wet. Because... Silence. No, I threw myself into the drain. They sang out that I wanted to drown myself. Then Duffy pulled me out, took me onto the bush on the other side and assaulted me again. At some stage during this, I, I became unconscious. When I woke up, I was lying down. I then sat up. And then three more men came. Hill was one of them. I asked them for a drink of water and he gave me one out of a jam tin. Then Duffy and Newman made a fire. Just as it was about made, they saw a policeman. They put me into the bush and told me to wait there until they came back, but they ran away. As far as I remember, Oscroft did not assault me. He was on the other side of the creek when the second four took me away. Mary Jane Hicks had come to Sydney looking for work. If you'd been lucky enough to find a job in a shop or as a barmaid, then she would have been working 10, 12 hours a day, six days a week, for a wage that would scarcely have paid her board and lodging. Such was the lot of the working girl. But this trial coincides with a great upwelling of what was called the women's cause. Judge Windia's own wife, Mary, was a leading campaigner, and the judge was on side. As Attorney General just eight years earlier, he introduced a law which gave women the right to keep their own property when they married. J.F. Archibald had also positioned himself as a great reformer, on the other side of the divide. He was a Republican, an opponent of capital punishment, and a champion of the working man. But he was also a man of fierce hatreds. He hated the rich, he hated Jews, and he treated Aborigines with contempt. And he was relentless in his mockery of women. Women, whether wives, strumpets, or girls who cried rape, were the great enemy, the great crushers of male virility. Question du jour. Has a chaste woman ever been raped? So, from the slope where you stood, you were an eyewitness to what took place. I was. We saw about 15 chaps throwing stones at a man who was next to a woman. And he appeared to be defending her from the chaps. I saw a man, the man Stanley. You may speak at your normal pace, Mr. Evans. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, a young fellow walked with the woman beside her and he had his arm around her neck. And the next thing I saw, the men who'd been pelting Scanley scatter and I lost sight of them for a while. And then I saw the girl come out of the bush by herself. How was her demeanour? Uh, walking, not that upset. Tell the court what happened then. She walked about a hundred yards and then the boy who took her in before ran after, grabbed her by the arm, and dragged her back again into the scrub. Mm. Can you identify any of these men? Well, the chap who took her, he was about his height. No further questions, Your Honour? <sighs> Mr Evans, at the police court, you said you thought one of the chaps was about Mr Hill's height. That's right. About Mr. Hill's height. And that another of the chaps is something resembled Mr. Mangan. 
I'm sorry, I can't read that word. Coat. His coat. About Mr. Hill's height. And you recognised him by his coat. No further questions, Your Honour? I'm employed at the Cook's stables. On the 9th of September, I was out in the swamp cutting wood. I heard a girl screaming. And shortly afterwards, I saw the prisoner Hill throw down the girl and Duffy holding his hands over her face. A stranger held the girl's legs while Hill assaulted her. Could you swear distinctly that Hill was the man who assaulted the girl? He was a tall man, about the height of Mr. Hill. I believe the man was Hill. How far away from you was the girl when she was thrown? About a hundred yards. Can you swear distinctly you saw Mr. Hill? Can you swear distinctly that you saw Mr. Hill? Not distinctly. No, I suppose not, no. I call William Stanley. I was in the bush near Waterloo Estate, walking across from Ramwick Racecourse. I stopped and asked a man for a match. I heard a girl screaming and I ran immediately in the direction of the screams. I saw the girl on the ground, surrounded by three men. Did the girl say anything to you? Oh, she called out. For God's sake, save me. Save me from these men. Describe to the court what you saw. M with his hand over the girl's mouth and E was holding onto her legs. The third man appeared to be committing some sort of assault. Hmm. Could you please describe to the court what happened then? I said, what the hell are you doing? I picked the girl up. I asked her if she'd like to come with me, that I could take her to a place of safety. We started to walk away. We got about 40 yards and, and then someone yelled out, what do you want to go and interfere for, you son of a dog? <laughs> and the whole band surrounded me. They pelted me with sticks and with knives. What happened while this fight was going on? He dragged her away. I mean, she was screaming out, for God's sake, save me. I fought for as long as I could, and then I ran away. Can you identify any others in the court who were present that afternoon? He was the one holding the stick. I recognised him by the scar on his face. I recognised him, and I recognised him. I believe he was also there, but I could not positively swear. It was hardly chivalrous, Mr. Stanley, to run away. Come on, you would have done the same. I ran directly to Redfern Police Station. Did you not swear, Mr. Stanley, at the police court that the man Fuller, who was also at that court in the dock, had been present at the outrage? I did. Could you tell the court why that man was subsequently discharged? It was his brother, I'd say. Well, they look so alike, it's hard to tell them apart. So you made a mistake in your identification, Mr. Stanley. Is it true that there was another man at that court whose identity you swore to, then afterwards doubted? I swear, I swear to these prisoners. Answer these the men. question, Mr. Stanley. Yes, that was true. No further questions, Your Honour. We was there, about 200 yards away when we seen about 18, maybe 20 men fighting with knives and sticks. The man Stanley was taking her part, trying to fight them. Did you see anyone else? The girl, Hicks, waving her umbrella and cooing. 
crying like. Two of the men were holding her. Can you identify any men in the court who were fighting? Him. 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 And him. Can't say him for sure. I seen Boyce, Reed, Newman and Miller before. In Irish town. Gambling. And I seen Duffy boxing. What did you see after Mary Jane Hicks was led back toward the scrub? Him. Assaulting her. He was holding her mouth. After Hill, Duffy assaulted her. No one was holding her then. Then one of them sung out. Three more. What I'm saying is, you ask any man who employs youths between, say, 13 years and 18 years of age, they'll tell you the same thing. For years I've heard them, years of boasting about hunting and overpowering women. Waves of pack rape. This, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, one has difficulty even guessing at a motive. The respectable folks in Sydney saw themselves as building a civilization. And their fear of the larrikins ran very deep. What if these boys, these descendants of the convicts, were the real Australians? It was just one year before the centenary of the First Fleet. And for many, the blood and the bruises of Mary Jane Hicks were evidence enough of a convict stain. Brute man breaking through the crust of civilization. Oh, it was the queerest story ever told. In her affidavit, she says her board and lodging was paid for a week by a man she'd known in Bathurst. Then she puts up with Mrs. Anderson in Haymarket, who obligingly charges her nothing for board. The woman's best protection is her own virtue, not the lash or the gallows. Good God. Sorry, God. Up until October 5th, you said nothing about Hill holding your arm and taking you away from Stanley. Do you still claim that Mr. Hill assaulted you? I then said and say today that I do not know whether he assaulted me. Miss Hicks, could you tell the court where you are staying at the present time? Peterson Police Station. Are you familiar with the shooting gallery kept by Mr. Camp? No. Are you familiar with the shooting gallery kept by Mr. Gordon? No. Have you ever gone to the coffee palace with a man? I never go to the coffee palace. Did you not say at the police court that while Duffy and the men were assaulting you, your legs were not held down? Under the circumstance, I might have been somewhat confused. Uh, so it pleased the court for permission to re-examine the prosecutrix, Your Honour. Granted, following Mr. Canaway's cross-examination, you said Mr. Duffy asked you to take your dress off. Yes. Which you did. Yes. Did Mr. Duffy use force to make you take your dress off? No. You had had connection with a man before? I was... Yes. Could you repeat that, Miss Hicks? Yes. No further questions, Your Honour. Does my learned friend intend to leave the matter there? Canaway was on shaky ground. Even in the 1880s, a woman's sexual history was largely deemed off-limits, subject to the discretion of the judge. I cautioned you, Mr. Canaway, that if you picked out and quoted from the depositions passages that could only be clearly explained by what preceded and followed them, I should have the depositions read through. Your question where left implies an attack on the character of the girl. Does Your Honour mean that my question does not faithfully represent the circumstances of the case referred to in the deposition? Certainly. If it pleases the court. Yes, Mr. Foreman. 
the jury is not concerned with the girl's um, antecedents and does not wish to hear them. I appreciate that. Thank you. But now that the matter has been raised for the sake of clarity, I ask that Ms. Hicks's deposition to the police court at the committal hearing be read to the court. The defence had cleverly placed Mary Jane Hicks's virtue on trial. It was a pivotal moment in the Mount Rennie case. And then Ms. Hicks deposed, about two years ago, someone had connection with me. I came down to Sydney with my brother and stopped in Petersham. A married man had connection in me. I knew him a week, and at the end of the week, he had connection with me. He held my mouth. He said it would bring a disturbance between him and his wife. I went back to the Bathurst Orphanage. I was brought up there. No one there had connection in me. No further questions, Your Honour. Can you describe to the court your state of health when you gave your evidence to the police court? I was very ill. And for the court, can you explain why you did not name any of the prisoners when you were first asked to identify them at the police station and at the hospital? I, I didn't know the names of the prisoners at the time. <coughs> no further questions? You have a statement from a warder here in Darlinghurst Jail? I do. Would you please read to the court a statement that the prisoner Duffy made to the warder on 18th September last? Myself, uh, Donnellan and Boyce, Fuller and Martin did assault the girl Mary Jane Hicks, but she was a consenting party. Sir? None of the others had anything to do. So I have to go. Thank you. Oh, well, may it please the court, Miss Hicks would like permission to leave the courtroom. It's granted. <laughs> I trust the girl will receive any assistance she requires. I will adjourn if the jury really wish it, but I desire above all things to avoid keeping them from their homes over Sunday. So I suggest that we continue until approximately midnight and commence again tomorrow at 9 a.m. It's a travesty. Do you remember how much time elapsed between when you saw the alleged fight with the man Stanley and when the police arrived on the scene? Sorry? Do you remember how much time elapsed between when you I saw don't get the word. I can't understand him. Passed. How much time passed? Got it. I first came on the scene between two and three o'clock. The coppers got there at five. You stated yesterday that you saw Mr. Duffy assaulting the prosecutrix, but you've had a long-standing dispute with Mr. Duffy, have you not, Mr. Smith? No. Mr. Duffy thrashed you once for impudence. I'd remember that. No. About three months ago, the police helped you move from your lodgings at Redfern. They gave you a new pair of boots and a new pair of trousers. Yes. I put it to you, Mr. Smith, that you could not have seen the event in the detail which you describe. You were too far away. I followed from place to place. Sometimes I was five or ten yards away. Near the end, Duffy threatened to kick me. Are you aware, Mr. Smith, that the prisoners are on trial for their lives? Yes. Over the next night and day, the court heard from 80 defence witnesses. 
who testified that the youths had been home for lunch at the time of the outrage, or working with them all day, or they presented character references. One man accused William Stanley of stealing his purse in a boarding house. Under cross-examination, some of the alibis were watertight, others found it. Another 14-hour day, I presume. Judge Windia has little more mercy for juries than he does the accused. And why are the arbiters of life and death being held into states of physical and mental collapse? Why is this trial so very, very go as you please? Because Judge Windy is frantic to get to London. The Queen can't have her jubilee without him. Justice or the jubilee? No contest. All rise. Archibald may well have been right. Windy had booked a berth on a ship to England. Please tell the court how you know the prosecutrix, Mary Jane Hicks. Well, I used to have a shooting gallery in Goulburn Street with Mr. Campbell. In August, the prosecutrix was inquiring after a young man in the boarding house next door. And then what happened, Mr. Doran? She was standing in the doorway. We got into a conversation. We made an appointment for the following night. And could you please tell the court what happened the following night? What men and women do? She wanted intercourse. I gave it to her quite a few times. <laughs> she was begging for it, as a matter of fact. <laughs> No further questions, Your Honour. <clears throat> Mr. Doran, you were charged with running a gaming table at a race course, were you not? Yes. And you went to prison for how long? Three months. No further questions. Continue, Mr. Teese. So you heard Mr. Doran in court yesterday saying that he had had improper intercourse with you. It's untrue. Had you ever seen Mr. Doran before yesterday when you saw him in this court? No, I never saw him in my life before. There's not a word of truth in what he said. No further questions, Your Honour. After the long hours of a long trial, from Monday to Friday, at last it has become my duty <coughs> to address you. As to Hill, the girl's account was that the only part he played in the affair was to take her away from Stanley. <coughs> and after conducting her some distance, leave her. Stanley said the same Thing. The only other flippant witness was Thomas Smith. He says Hill assaulted the girl. But surely she would have been able to recognize him. She was not dazed and foaming at the mouth at that stage. This is one of the strongest points in favor of Hill. Prisoner Duffy. Prisoner Duffy's life is in danger solely on the evidence of the prosecutrix Mary Jane Hicks. I would ask the jury if she was a credible witness. Upon her evidence alone, you cannot convict the boy Duffy. No one has more sympathy for the girl than I. But when 
it comes to a court of justice. You must throw all sympathy to one side. Members of the jury, it is 2.45 a.m. I apologize for having to address you at this time of the morning. My learned friend has claimed that if you have any doubt, then his client should receive the benefit. Look at the character of the witnesses for the defense. Innocent men did not require to put witnesses into the box to tell lies. The prisoner Duffy stands identified by five witnesses and stands out as the greatest ruffian. In the case of Boyce, six witnesses, three witnesses swore to Miller, two to Keegan. Reed traveled away under a false name. If you are convinced beyond reasonable doubt, then stamp out this evil which is destroying the fair fame of this land. It is 3.25 a.m. Members of the jury, I will not commence to address you now. I will do so at 9 o'clock. begging for it, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I should like to express my regret to the gentlemen of the jury for keeping them sitting so long at a time. But as some of them are not in good health, I thought it best to continue the case and have it over as soon as possible, so as not to cause an adjournment. The jury Ah, uh, men of the world, you know that even if the girl were of ill fame and bad character, that did not entitle her to be knocked down and outraged as if she were a beast. She would be under the protection of the law even if she were such a character as he had mentioned. By the time Judge Windia finished summing up the case, 11 hours had passed. If you are convinced that one or any of them were guilty of the crime, it is your duty to fearlessly return a verdict accordingly. Even though it should be brought back to you in its most terrible form. I put money on it. The jury took just two hours and 30 minutes to reach its verdict. William Newman. Guilty. Michael Donnellan, guilty. Thomas Oscroft, not guilty. Joseph Martin, guilty. William Boyce, guilty. 
Hugh Miller, guilty. Robert George Reed, guilty. George Keegan, guilty. Michael Mangan, not guilty. William Hill, guilty. George Duffy, guilty. The jury begs to ask the court for mercy on the prisoners, on account of their youth, my lord. For mercy, Your Honor! They're our boys! It's just a boy, Your Honor! Silence in the court! Outrages such as this are not committed upon the children of the rich, the surroundings of whose life give their children protection but on the daughters of the people who, in pursuit of their honest avocations, are compelled to go out alone, exposed to the attacks of such gangs of ruffians as choose to assault them. The sentence of the court is that you be taken hence to the place from whence you came, and thence on a day hereafter to be named by the governor and council, and then to be severally hanged by the neck until your body be dead. God help you to repent for these crimes. This is not right! Damn it! Oh, it's all your fault! All of it! Empty your stinking chamber pot and get yourself out of my house! You're a disgusting, filthy, filthy girl! Nine of the boys were guilty, and the Sydney papers were full of argument about how they should be punished. An American said that in his country, they would be tied to a tree and shot. Others called for mercy. As the day of the hanging approached, thousands of those people packed the Sydney Town Hall. Now, most of them accepted that the boys were guilty, but they had alternative punishments in mind. Maybe prison combined with flogging, or branding, or even castration. Petitions flooded into Government House from public meetings, from the streets and from employer groups. In private, Archibald worked on the Governor through the bulletin. Lord Carrington, may it please Your Excellency, a rape is now being committed on the Goddess of Justice, of whom Your Excellency is the appointed guardian. I attach a detailed, legally attested account of the times of the court sittings and propose a deputation of Sir Henry Parks, Rabbi Davis, Cardinal Moran. Archibald, of course, wanted no punishment at all. He kept up his criticism of Mary Jane Hicks as a lying little street tramp who was sending high-spirited Australian lads to the gallows. And he wasn't alone. Hounded by the public, Mary Jane Hicks sought refuge in the convent of the Good Samaritan. Though the jury found me guilty, I'm completely innocent. I saw the girl that day. I acted the man to her. Are you innocent? Jane Hicks is a lion. Stop! Stop! Please, I can't help you. Bring her in! Stop it! Stop it! Reverend Bing, I knew Mary Jane Hicks when she first came to Sydney. She is a girl who, though not unintelligent, is yet innocent of worldly knowledge. She is a very trusting young woman. A young man's life is at stake. This is the Reverend Bing from the Presbyterian Church. The condemned man, William Hill, 
His aunt is under employment in the Reverend's home. He'd like to ask you a question. I asked Sergeant Brennan if he would be a witness. If William Hill is executed, would you feel his death on your conscience? I think I would, yes. I never said anything about Hill assaulting me, but others have charged him with assaulting me. Mary Jane Hicks's affidavit requesting leniency for Hill joined the growing number of petitions from across the colony. To His Excellency, the Right Honourable Charles Robert Barron, this humble petition. Whereas nine youths are now lying under sentence of death. Guilt is in doubt. Some of them are only 19. Only 17 years of age. Would bring the administration of justice into contempt. Respectfully pray. And request. To all of the condemned, the royal prerogative of mercy. Of mercy. Of mercy. Mary's petition was swept up in a great deluge of petitions to the governor, Lord Carrington. The crime was grotesque, but to hang nine boys. The governor and the rest of the executive council met here to review the trial, and they found reasons to save just three, commuting their sentences to life in prison. Donnellan, Keegan, Miller, Six youths would now hang, and one of them was Hill. Mary Jane Hicks's plea for Hill had been unsuccessful, but it preyed on Judge Windia's mind. He wrote to Lord Carrington while he was indeed en route to London. I revisit my request to the Executive Council, that is, that prisoner Hill's sentence be mitigated. Hill, get yeah. up! And then Duffy wrote a letter to the governor, telling him again that he believed Newman to be innocent. Now only Duffy and three others would hang. A special gallows was built here inside the prison building, designed to hang all four boys at once. 150 people squeezed in to witness the spectacle. And they saw the hangman, Syphilitic Bob, make a mess of his task. He miscalculated the weight of the ewes. One of the boys died instantly, but the other three struggled at the end of their ropes for minutes, and one bit his tongue in half. The trial of Mary Jane Hicks did not put an end to gang rape. The pushes became more organised and in the next decade, the Sydney courts heard 13 more cases. But the case did demonstrate that white women were winning a voice, that rape was not accepted as part of the rough and tumble of colonial society. And in fact, in 15 years, Australia joined New Zealand to become the second country in the world where white women had the right to vote in national elections. And Mary Jane Hicks? The people of Sydney contributed to a support fund and she used the money to travel to New Zealand in search of a new beginning. We know nothing of Mary Jane Hicks's life there, except that she died six years later at the age of 22.